Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the International Security Program and joining us live tonight to continue this conversation. Emily, as always, good to see you. You too. So President Biden called the airlift an extraordinary success in his remarks today. What are your thoughts on the exit? I mean, the airlift itself was an extraordinary success. It was a massive logistical challenge. Our troops and our diplomats did amazing work, behaved bravely. They, they saved the lives of many Americans getting them out in time. But as much as the airlift itself was a success, it's hard to say that the withdrawal as a whole has been a success. I mean, I think this will be explored in many books to come and in the history books for its downsides as well as the, the massive effort and the brave deeds of our troops. Well, let's focus on the now. By your team's estimates, 550,000 people have been forcibly displaced in Afghanistan this year alone. 80% of them are women and children. So what does life look like for the people who are now in Afghanistan under the Taliban control with U.S. forces gone. It looks very uncertain. There's a lot of questions about what kind of government the Taliban will put together, what kind of economic system they will seek to have in place. There's many questions about how they're going to treat women. What they're saying now is that they want women to be able to participate in society as long as it's underneath the, the rubric of Islamic law, and they have not been clear about what their interpretation of Islamic law is going to be. There are going to be many more people who are internally displaced inside Afghanistan as they try to figure out whether they're safe in their homes. I expect there's going to be masses of people at Pakistan's border and at Iran's border seeking exit from an uncertain future. There is growing concern, as you know, that the Taliban's victory opens up the door to other ter terrorist groups to plan attacks against the U.S., both home and abroad. Does the fact that the U.S. no longer has a diplomatic presence in Afghanistan further complicate that and increase that threat for Americans? It does. President Biden has talked a lot about this over-the-horizon intelligence collection capability. I think that's just too rosy a picture that he's painting. It is possible to collect some information using standoff capabilities, uh, using overflights, but it's not the same as having a presence on the ground where you can do things like recruit human sources, where you can get the true on-the-ground insight into what's going on before you do things like tip and cue other assets. It's just a very difficult picture trying to collect in a denied area. The Taliban, Emily, has said that it will uphold Islam and create a holy Islamic state. What exactly does that mean for folks at home to understand? I mean, it's not clear exactly what the Taliban means yet. There are many interpretations of what an Islamic state looks like around the world. You could look at Iran. You can look at what ISIS tried to create in Syria. You can also look to other states around the world that incorporate some aspects of Islam into their constitution, ranging from Saudi Arabia, where there's a very close relationship between the state and the church, to Morocco, where they actually wrote women's rights into the constitution. So there's, there's a wide interpretation of how you could incorporate Islam into a functioning government. The Taliban's previous attempt at governing did a more extreme version of Islam, and we really don't want to see that return for the sake of the people who are still on the ground there. And the people is who we think about tonight, the, the thousands of families, women and children included, uh, left with such an uncertain future. Emily Harding, as always, appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you. Thank you.